let's go ahead and open up. Uh, well, let me. I wanted to open up with a reading to you from Mark's Gospel. This is chapter 10. And they, that is the disciples, were bringing children to him, that is Jesus, so that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms and began blessing them, laying his hands upon them. Well, again, my name is, uh, is Doug Potter. Uh, let me give you a little bit about my background, at least with respect to apologetics and also with respect uh, to, uh, to kids and, and children, which is what we're going to be talking about. Um, I came down here uh, several years ago, that is to the Charlotte area, to actually go to school and study Christian apologetics. I had no ambition of going into the ministry, no ambition of being a pastor, no ambition to um, uh, even get out of my profession, which was a shop teacher. That's what I taught, mostly drafting uh, and I, at the high school level, and I had planned to do that. Uh, and I just came to study apologetics so that I could be a better parent someday, so I could be uh, a better uh, teacher, Sunday school teacher, and never had any ambitions of going into the ministry whatsoever. All I wanted to do was to know uh, what the faith was and to be able to defend it to others. Uh, and to do that pretty uh, effectively. There are two reasons I think that I can uh, speak today about children and apologetics. One is because I was a child and I grew up in a Christian home. I would have to say that um, I did not receive a whole lot of instruction when it was appropriate in Christian apologetics, uh, but I was uh, educated in a Christian home and within a Christian church, uh, a Baptist church, and uh, pretty much have grown up in the church and been uh, going to church all of my life. Uh, I was saved at a very early age, at the age of five. Uh, and again, uh, when it was appropriate, got some training, some basic training and understanding in Christian apologetics, but not, not near what I think it needs to be today for uh, children as, uh, as uh, I'll unfold uh, what I have for you today. Uh, we'll get into that in more detail. The other uh, reason uh, that I think I can talk to you about this is I have a daughter, and she's in fourth grade, and she's kind of my little experiment when it comes to Christian apologetics. I practice this out on her, and if it works, then I bring it to you, or I bring it to where I teach. If it doesn't work, then you'll probably never hear about it. So the stuff that I'm going to talk today, I at least think, uh, works out with kids. At least it works with my daughter. Uh, and I don't think she's a uh, uh, typical, but um, uh, nonetheless, uh, hopefully some of the things I say, some of the things I illustrate, you'll be able to pass on and you'll be able to use as well with respect to children uh, and apologetics. Also, I want to mention that I think that the plate for parents today, uh, the metaphorical plate, the parental plate of all the things that you have to do on a day-to-day -day basis, week-to-week -week basis, monthly, I know that plate is full. It's full for parents, it's full for teachers, it full, it's full for your pastor as well. And coming along with the idea of children and Christian apologetics puts me in the position of having to convince you to shove one more thing onto an already full plate. And that's a difficult task. And so I think part of what I want to do is to be able to convince you of the importance of it. I don't want anything to fall off the plate when I push it on there, but I want some things to be smushed together so that you can see this is one more thing that's worth spending a little bit of time thinking about, a little bit of time praying about, and most importantly, uh, a little bit of time of getting yourself trained in Christian apologetics so you can uh, entrust uh, and be equipped to deal with issues related to children and apologetics, which of course this is just the beginning and the start of even thinking about it. But just by a show of hands, how many of you are, are parents or grandparents with children? Just about all of you? Okay. How many of you are teachers of children in the church, in the context of the church? Okay. And um, anybody a pastor in here? Okay. Great. So, so we got everybody represented uh, that I'm really addressing this too. So that's good. That's very, very good. So what I would like to do 
is to basically answer three questions. Uh, the first is why we should teach it, when do we teach it, and third, how do we teach it. And what I have envisioned here is a comprehensive plan or a comprehensive curriculum that will take them from preschool all the way through the secondary education, which is well into high school, uh, preschool to high school. And I want to start off with a comment that I didn't make. Uh, in fact, a colleague of mine made it when I was talking to him uh, about this, this issue or this, this topic. We kind of um, uh, run things by each other. And he made a very good observation that I think is extremely important. And I want to start off with it. Uh, he put it into words. I kind of had the concept, but he put it into words. So I'm going to give it to you this way. The younger you go in teaching, in other words, the younger you are in terms of who you have to teach or who you have to instruct, or more you need to understand the nature of the subject of Christian apologetics in order to be able to see its relationship uh, to the development of the child or the people that you're teaching. And that's an extremely important observation. In fact, I would want someone who teaches preschool to have as much training and as well put it this way as much understanding of the subject of Christian apologetics as someone who's teaching high school even more so uh, and as we'll see not because I expect them to come in and formally teach Christian apologetics to young young people no that's not what I mean but they need to understand the subject so that they can observe the child and the child's development and see in the life of the child and the development of the child what is important to that development, life and growth of the child related to Christian apologetics. Let me start with a definition so that we're all on the same page with respect to apologetics. Uh, I would define it this way, and this is a definition that I would use in a secondary school classroom or, or a high school students uh, in a church setting. Uh, this is what I mean by apologetics. It's the application of knowledge to demonstrate that Christianity is true. The application of knowledge to demonstrate that Christianity is true. Now let me uh, start off by saying what apologetics is not. Apologetics is not the same thing as doing Bible study or teaching the Bible. That's extremely important to do and most important for children uh, who are growing up and who are young in the faith. Absolutely. But it's not the same thing. You can't do Bible study and think you're doing apologetics. And let me add this in there with respect to Bible study. It's not the same thing as creationism or teaching creation. Creation is extremely important. There are things in creation and creationism that are certainly related to apologetics, but it's not the same thing. It's also not the same thing as the Christian worldview. Developing a Christian worldview is extremely important. And their whole life experience and development in Christian education, uh, uh, it's very important they develop a worldview. But apologetics is not the same thing as the Christian worldview. Apologetics supports the Christian worldview and shows how the Christian world is true, but it's not the same thing. I'd also like to suggest that it's not the same thing as evangelism. Uh, evangelism is extremely important for the child in terms of coming to faith. Uh, but it's not the, apologetics is not the same thing as evangelism. Now, apologetics can support evangelism, but it's not the same thing. And also, finally, I would like to really stress this, that it's not the same thing as the Holy Spirit working in the life of the child. Apologetics certainly can be used by the Holy Spirit uh, to bring people to faith, even uh, children to faith in some cases, uh, especially if they're not, haven't grown up in a Christian home and had that Christian influence. Uh, but it's not the same thing. I don't want you to think that demonstrating or using knowledge, applying knowledge to demonstrate that Christianity is true is the same thing or a substitute for the Holy Spirit working in the believer's life or in the young child's life. That's not at all. And I don't expect in any way for Christian apologetics to replace any of those things I mentioned that it's not. Those things are on the plate and they're just as important as Christian apologetics, 
But Christian apologetics in the life and development of the child is really a new area, a new thing I'm pushing onto the plate of the parent in order to get you thinking and get the wheels kind of rolling with respect to where this plays a role in the development of the child as we go along. Let me give you a quote from C.S. Lewis that I think is extremely important uh, at this point that kind of emphasizes uh, this definition. Most uh, people have heard of him, uh, and he's very well known, at least within the apologetic community. He says this, One of the great difficulties is to keep before the audience's mind the question of truth. They always think you are recommending Christianity, not because it is true, but because it is good. One must keep on pointing out that Christianity is a statement which, if false, is of no importance, and if true, of infinite importance. The one thing it cannot be is moderately important. And I think that's very important with respect to the definition that I've given you here and how we are to understand Christian apologetics. It is the application of knowledge to demonstrate that Christianity is true. Not that it's good, not that it's helpful, it's those things, but apologetics doesn't deal with establishing those things. It deals with establishing the fact that it is indeed true, and by true, I mean that which is opposed to it is false. So I think C.S. Lewis is right in reminding us here, and I would remind anyone that would teach on apologetics and look to apply it to the life of children, that that really is the goal that we have in mind, is to demonstrate the truth of Christianity. One poor reason, before we get into why we should do apologetics, let me start off with one poor reason to teach apologetics. Now, uh, I'm going to be stepping on some toes of some of my colleagues here at this, at this particular point, uh, and friends, uh, and even ministries, who often uh, will put this up, and you've probably seen it in newspapers, you've probably seen it on advertisements, maybe, maybe not, but uh, frequently apologetic ministries and apologetic groups and apologists will put this forward as a reason we need to be doing apologetics for, with young people or with children. 70% of Christian youth leave the church after high school. Now that's true. There's no doubt about it. In fact, we can go back with uh, longitudinal studies for the past 30 years, and you'll see the percentages, 50, 60, all the way up to about 70, maybe even some cases even higher than that, of Christian youth stopping their church attendance after high school in our society and our culture. But have you ever thought about this? What about those that um, don't go on to college? This, this one particular has to do with kids going on to college. What about those that don't go on to college? Do you think that's higher or lower with respect to stopping going to church? It's higher, believe it or not. It's higher. Uh, it's up to 76, even higher. That is, um, uh, those that don't go on to a two-year or four-year college after high school have a higher rate of stopping their church attendance. Uh, what I would like to suggest to you is that this is not a problem that Christian apologetics is going to solve. Let me give you this quote from a study that put 30 years of uh, surveys together. It says that the data from 30 years of the general survey, social survey pinpoints that age 22 is the point in life course when average levels of weekly or more frequent church attendance are at their lowest, around 17%. The climb back into regular or semi-regular religious practice, if it occurs at all, and it usually does, is often stimulated by marriage and childbearing. What I think is probably going on here is you have kids who have graduated from high school, they're out of the home environment, whether they're uh, employed or they're um, off to college and in the dorm room, that are just free for the first time, and they've decided, I'm going to you know, sleep in on Sunday morning. I'm not going to go to church as regularly as I did when I was growing up. And maybe I don't need that, whatever the reasoning happens to be. In fact, I would say that if you visited me in my dorm room, I went right from high school into college, and if you visited me on a typical Sunday morning in my dorm room, you probably would have caught me sleeping in. 
and not going to church on Sunday morning. And if I filled out a survey, my attendance would have dropped as well. I didn't cease being a Christian. I didn't cease being a believer. Uh, but I was just tired because of whatever was going on. I think that's pretty typical. What happens is, later on in life, you get married, you have a baby, and guess what? You're back in church because all of a sudden when you've got a baby and you go, how do I raise this baby? I need help. And you turn to the church because they're there with help for you with respect to raising kids and getting plugged in and getting help with with uh, related to the responsibilities of parenting. The church is a central place to provide that. I don't think apologetics is going to solve this particular problem, but it does bring us to another question I want to address. How corrosive is college to faith? And this is another quote from the same survey. Those students who lose their faith in college or drop out of organized religion after high school are primarily those already at considerable risk of doing so for other reasons that predate these actions. To suggest the die is cast before the dorm room is occupied may be too strong a claim, but not by much. As Christian Smith a Melinda Denton, 2005 note in Soul Searching, parents tend to get what they are when it comes to their teenagers' religious sense. So I don't think uh, that uh, uh, as much as it's a problem and a concern of 70% of kids leaving uh, the church or stopping their church attendance, if they're leaving the faith at that point, uh, it's it's not something, it's something that was cast or was put before they even got there with respect to their religious rearing and upbringing, as this study suggests. Now, I don't know a full answer to how corrosive college, as we'll see a little bit later on, it can be, depending on perhaps where you go, extremely corrosive, very corrosive, and damaging to your faith. And perhaps if that's the case, then apologetics can help with respect to college being corrosive to your faith if it's implemented and you experience it, uh, as I'm going to suggest here, at least at the secondary level in a class, in a formal setting, uh, and learn it as a subject of study. And one last thing to point out with respect to parents. If parents, this is from the same study, do not actively affirm and transmit the oral and written tradition of a religion, their failure to teach the language results in youth who cannot speak the language and are at elevated risk of shedding the religious value system altogether. Indeed, scholars often forget that religion is primarily taught, not caught or transmitted by osmosis. And so I think that the key to the solution to a corrosive, um, uh, uh, college being corrosive to faith, uh, to um, uh, people leaving the faith uh, is the parent, and by that I mean broadly speaking the pastor and the Sunday school teacher, those who would see and have oversight over them, uh, being intentional about teaching the religious faith. And so uh, I think as we incorporate apologetics into our understanding of uh, teaching and raising the child concerning Christian education, it's very, very important that we be intentional about it. Have in mind a good understanding of the subject of Christian apologetics and the development of the child. So I also would like to emphasize, and I'll emphasize this throughout the message, that the solution to integrating Christian apologetics and the education of children starts with the training and the preparation of the parents, the teachers, uh, the pastors, of uh, the preschooler all the way through the secondary education level or the high schooler. So let's jump into our three questions we want to address with that out of the way. Why should we teach Christian apologetics? Let me give you three uh, reasons why we should teach Christian apologetics. First, the Bible commands the use of Christian apologetics. Second, history demonstrates its success. And third, I think there's a contemporary need that exists today. First of all, the Bible commands the use of Christian apologetics. This is Paul in Philippians. He says, For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me, knowing that I am put here for the defense 
of the gospel. Paul saw that his purpose at this point in his life was defending and confirming the gospel. In 1 Peter 3.15, a very common verse to many who study apologetics, you've probably heard it, but hear it again. But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And finally, dear friends from the book of Jude, Although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt a, I had to write you to urge you to contend. To contend for what? To contend for the faith that once for all was entrusted to the saints. I'd like to suggest that putting these three verses together, we get a decent philosophy that the Bible gives us with respect to apologetics. Observe the red areas that I've highlighted here in these verses. Defending and confirming the gospel. Giving an answer, which implies that you're preparing yourself to actually be able to give an answer and to make it a reasonable answer concerning the hope or the faith that you have. Certainly to do it with gentleness and respect. Not to be arrogant about it, but to do it with gentleness and respect and understanding. To do it humbly with others. And then also Jude gives us to, to be contending. It's not only for the gospel that Paul gives us in Philippians. It's not only giving a reasonable answer that Peter gives us. But it's contending for the faith. That is the body of knowledge that makes up the Christian faith. That's what I think is a good approach to doing uh, apologetics and a good philosophical approach, biblical approach to doing apologetics. And I'd like to suggest in terms of history, there's at least two steps that are involved in doing apologetics. The first step is to establish the existence of God. That is the God who we have faith in, establishing his existence. And the second is to, as Paul says, to defend the gospel, that is, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So apologetics in this sense is understood, in a biblical sense, is understood in a two-step approach, defending the faith and the existence of God and defending the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when you look at history, as we'll see in just a little bit, that's exactly what develops among some of the Christian thinkers that wrote on this. They always had in front of them doing those two steps with respect to apologetics. And so history demonstrates it. Paul, in the first century, used it against Judaism, Hellenism, and early Gnosticism. Read Acts 17, for example. Uh, Paul there uh, faces Hellenism. Uh, Stoic and Epicurean philosophers, would, which would be equivalent to atheists and pantheists today. Uh, there he argues for the true God and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah. In the third century, uh, a uh, church father by the name of Origen used it to defend the resurrection against Celsius uh, the Jew. In fact, some of the arguments that Origen used in his book, which was one of the largest apologetic books written in the third century, uh, the arguments he has in there for the resurrection are still used today by modern apologists. In fact, when I first started reading it, I was amazed at the fact that he laid out, probably the first one to lay out, the arguments that are still used today for the resurrection of Jesus Christ by modern-day apologists. In 335 to 430, Augustine used it against paganism. Uh, his book, The City of God, still stands to get today as probably the greatest apologetic work written up to that point against paganism. That is the belief in many gods. And then probably up to the medieval period, 1224 to 1227, Thomas Aquinas comes along with probably what I would call uh, the pinnacle of Christian apologetics being done, in which he argues against the spread of Islam and the Summa Contra Gentiles. That is a summary of his apologetic against the Contra, the Gentiles, which at that point uh, are uh, the pagans 
and Islam, which is spreading through Spain. In fact, he was urged by uh, missionaries in Spain to give them something in written form that they could use to stop the spread of Islam and give a defense for the faith. And it's a positive defense of Christianity, the Summa Contra Gentiles. Uh, and all of these people I've identified here had success and failure with apologetics. In fact, in Acts 17, if you read it, it says that some believed with respect to the gospel, some wanted to uh, hear more, uh, and some snickered and did not believe at all. The three exhaustive responses is what you always get with apologetics, but nonetheless, the Bible lays out this as our command to do apologetics. And finally, I think there's a contemporary need that exists. Uh, we are not in the 1930s and 40s when Billy Graham is starting his crusade movement where you could have a huge crusade and have lots of people coming to faith by just preaching the gospel. That was good for a time, and it worked. But if you spend much time in evangelism, and I talk to a lot of people that do a lot of evangelism, you are almost going to have to be prepared to integrate Christian apologetics into your evangelism, because the time in which we live now is not the time in which everybody has a common acceptance of God's existence. They just don't. Even if they believe some kind of God exists, it's usually a different God than Christianity. And so it's going to take us to be prepared and relating it back to our children to also preparing them to deal in a world that is multicultural, multi-faith, uh, in terms of there being many different faiths, many different beliefs that they're going to run into. That's the way it exists today. Uh, I would suggest that objections to Christianity, of which there have always been objections to Christianity throughout history, need to be taken seriously. The parent, the teacher, and the pastor, if a child asks a question or someone else asks a question, an earnest, heartfelt uh, inquiry, that question should never be addressed or pushed to the, to, the sh to the side. It needs to be answered. If you can't answer it right then and there, then you have to get training and equipping to be able to answer it and come back and address it there. You need to take the questions seriously. Many Christian teenagers graduate, graduate uh, not knowing why they believe the faith. Uh, we can't grow uh, Christians up, give them Christian education that just tells them what to believe. It has to incorporate or integrate why it is true and why they need to believe it. And that's what apologetics does. I mentioned it before, but the university and colleges teach scholarly views that are contrary to Christianity. And it is many that go off to college, and they likely do lose their faith in the classroom. They step for the first time into a philosophy class or into a Bible class. I'll put myself and my own example in there. I went to um, a very uh, a private school that was very liberal in its understanding of Christianity. Uh, the, my advisor said, look, you have to take a religion class, take it and get it out of the way. And I thought, hey. I grew up in the church. I was raised in the church. I was saved at the, uh, when I was five years old. I've been taught the Bible in Sunday school. I've gone to church. I've read the Bible myself. Uh, I know all about the Bible. This ought to be a breeze to get through. So I signed up for introduction to the Bible. Within the first couple of weeks of that class, uh, I was taught by Disciples of Christ Minister, which is a very liberal denomination. He had attacked every cardinal truth of the Christian faith and destroyed uh, any traditional and every traditional understanding of the scripture with respect to its authorship and inspiration. And that was within the first couple of weeks. I started to severely doubt not so much my faith, which was intact, but whether I had the right view and understanding of the Bible as the inspired word of God and inerrant. He was destroying that understanding as I went through that class. I don't think it's different than today. That was the late 80s, early 90s when I was exposed to that. In all likelihood, it's even worse today with and, uh, many college professors, especially on secular universities, uh, in the New Testament, Old Testament, doesn't matter, in philosophy, are very much uh, tearing apart a traditional conservative understanding of Christianity. The media backs them up with documentaries and TV shows, you've probably seen them, that compromise our understanding of Scripture. Uh, and this, of course, wears away at the young student who is not prepared to face these types of challenges. So that's why we should teach Christian apologetics. Let's move on to when do we teach Christian apologetics. 
Before we do that, let me give you one warning that Jesus gave. He said this in Matthew 18, 5 through 6. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Let me define for you here what faith is. Because if Jesus is warning us here of temporal judgment in this life, for disrupting, disrupting the faith of the child, we better know what faith is. And I would submit to you that Hebrews 11.1 1 gives us a good description of faith. And as far as I can tell, just about every Christian major thinker that has talked about what faith is, from Augustine, Aquinas, and even John Calvin, all agree that this is a good definition of faith of what I'm going to give you. Faith is believing something is true based on the authority of, of another. It's not blind, but it is basing something that you believe is true on the authority of another. In other words, you don't figure it out or see it demonstrated in terms of its truth, but you accept it because someone else who has authority that you respect, love, and admire says that it's true. And with children, this is especially the case. I mentioned that I came of faith at the age of five when I was led by my brother to the Lord and prayed with my mom to receive Jesus uh, and to believe in him. And uh, I did the same thing with my daughter at the age of four. Uh, I accepted and my daughter accepted my authority as the parent to tell her what is true. She couldn't have it demonstrated to her, but she accepted it as true based upon my authority, God's authority, and the Bible's authority. That is the proper structure that exists for the child in terms of faith. And we should never disrupt that and do everything to reinforce that. And the reason I talk about disrupting it here is because I don't want anyone to think that what we do with high school students or college students in apologetics ought to in any way be put in front of young children that are in preschool, uh, middle school, uh, or junior high, um, It's uh, where they have that delicate faith authoritative structure that exists. We should not put arguments for the existence of God that we may do in high school or in college into preschool. That would be ridiculous, that would be disastrous, and that's not what I'm looking for. And I would also suggest to you that this notion of authority that exists in the child really continues into adulthood. Even today, we accept things based on faith or the authority of others. Even as I do apologetics and stand before you here today, I accept certain things based on experts in the field of study that I don't have direct knowledge or demonstration of, and I accept it in a kind of faith. I'm not an astrophysicist. When I take a point from an astrophysicist, I'm resting on the faith and the authority of the astrophysicist to give you that to you with respect to doing apologetics. So faith in this authority that exists really never leaves. We just grow and acquire more knowledge at certain points in our life in the development of a child in which we can uh, then uh, uh, show and use that knowledge that they develop. Uh, and their development as well, uh, and show that Christianity is true, which is apologetics. In fact, I often use uh, the description that an apologist is really just a reporter. He's not an expert himself, but he has uh, his expertise, if he has one, is being able to take the information and the knowledge from other people who are experts in a certain field, and combine it together and show that it demonstrates Christianity is true and give a report with respect to it. That's pretty much how it works, uh, and I would expect that as Christians grow up, as young people grow up, they'll develop that understanding of apologetics and be able to incorporate that into their life and be a lifelong learner with respect to apologetics. So when, and particularly where, do we teach it? Well, I'd like to suggest uh, that uh, in light of what we just read from Jesus and the warning that he gave us not to cause any of these to stumble, I would like to suggest 
uh, that at the preschool, elementary, and even middle, junior, high grade level, uh, these are grades or ages one through five, grades one, uh, grades one through five, ages one through five, and grades six through eight, that we be very informal and indirect about it. What I want to be able to do is to identify in the development of the child uh, important things in their development that will later be important to teaching them and educating them in Christian apologetics. So I want normal Christian education and growth with respect to the Bible to take place between all of these grades. When you get into middle or junior high, you can do some formal instruction things and some direct instructional things, um, uh, but I don't uh, look for a full systematic class that demonstrates Christianity is true from ground zero to the truth of Christianity. That has to wait and hold off until they get into high school because it's there that you have the mental uh, development with respect to uh, logic and abstract thinking that starts to develop in those years where it's going to make sense to them and start to sink in. And it's also that age where they make that delicate transition from that authoritative faith relationship that exists between them, their parents, the Bible, their pastor, and their teacher, and it starts to take in knowledge that they make their own and see their own demonstration of those truths and those grades. That's where it becomes crucial and very important. So in my opinion, there's no formal class to do before the high school uh, grade level. Uh, at least I would suggest it's not desirable in a formal, direct, comprehensive sense. I'd also like to suggest that it needs to take place in the home, in the church, and if possible, in the school. I know not everyone goes to a Christian school, uh, but uh, it needs to be in all three. And if it can't be in all three, let's at least stick it in one with respect to the child and their experience in growing up. And again, I'll emphasize this that the most important person that receives the direct formal training in Christian apologetics is not the child, but it's the parent. It's the teacher and it's the pastor that receives that instruction. Because it's they who will then in turn look upon the child and know what is important to their development with respect to the subject of Christian apologetics. So finally, how do we teach it? And here I really have in mind what model or plan do we follow? And keep in mind the authoritative structure that Jesus emphasized between the parent and the child or the parent and the Bible and not to have that disrupted at any point. So how or what model uh, plan do we follow? And I'd like to give you a Christian apologetic model and identify various checkpoints in the development of the child where I think it's important for them to be uh, measured in terms of are they on the right track. If the child does this thing or expresses this thing, they're on the right track. And if they don't express this thing or this point or this benchmark, perhaps I can call it, then something's wrong and we need to go back and do something to help them out. So that's what I'm going to be identifying as we go along. The curriculum model that I would suggest for the preschool, uh, elementary age level, looks something like this, where you have the world as the foundation, God and Jesus. And you might be saying, why in the world did you stick God right in the middle of the world and Jesus? Why isn't God the biggest thing and the most important thing? Well, in Christian apologetics, and that's what this model is relating to, we know the world first. We have experience of the world and know that first, and then it's the world that we argue for or use to argue for the existence of God. And so the thing that becomes extremely important at this point is that nothing disrupt the experience of the child with respect to their conviction that the world is just evident to them. No one needs to teach them that. It just is. And it's then later on that we'll use the world in apologetics, but much later on, with respect to God, and then, of course, with respect to Jesus as well. And, of course, uh, in apologetics uh, or philosophy, uh, we call the world or knowing the world epistemology. That's our big term for that. God deals with theism, and, of course, uh, Jesus deals with Christianity and the Bible. 
and again at the lower grade level with respect to this model I'm about I'm concerned about preserving their normal Christian faith development I'm not asking to introduce anything formally new into their education except to have a parent child or pastor who's trained in apologetics to be able to say these are important areas let's make sure uh, we follow this model and acknowledge these things in the development of the child. So what does this look like in some practical terms? That's the theoretical model. What about some practical things? Well, I've listed a few things here, and I won't go through them one at a time, but I'll give you a few illustrations with respect to at least things that I've seen with my child uh, and her uh, development with respect to some of these things. One of the things I noticed when my daughter was an infant that I carried around is she just effortlessly took into the world and was able to classify things. I can remember holding her in my arms, walking through the backyard, and her constant question was, what's this? What's this? She said it over and over and over again, and I had to answer it, or the question would keep coming about the same thing before we could move on. And she, I could just remember she had no fear of anything. We could come across the ugliest looking spider and she's about ready to grab the thing and, you know, hold up and stick it in her mouth. I'm like, no, 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 don't do that. But she would say, what's this? And once I told her, I noticed that once I told her that that's a spider, she was effortlessly able to identify that spider when she saw it again, even if it was a different kind of spider. She had no problem whatsoever. In fact, even if she saw a picture of a spider in a book, she would still call it a spider, and she knew it wasn't a real spider. She knew the difference between the real ones and the pictures of spiders effortlessly. And in fact, uh, I remember we got her a bug collection, and she was able to classify. She used to group those bugs. I remember walking into the bathroom one time, and she had all the bugs that were a certain kind. All the grasshoppers were in a row. All the beetles were in a row. They were all classified perfectly. And if I took one bug away from her, she knew she was missing a bug. She was that good and that precise about it. Well, my suggestion is, is we don't need to do anything except, uh, except make sure nothing disrupts the fact that they are confident that they know the world because later on, what's going to happen is they will, um, when they get into college, they will face, in all likelihood, professors who say, you can't know that you know the world. Or you can't prove, as if philosophy is supposed to do that, that you know the world. That's the kind of skepticism that they're going to face. You can't demonstrate it as if it's as if putting the student in the position of having to demonstrate that. So they never lose that as they go along. And I remember my daughter asking me with respect to God, she said, Dad, we were driving the car, she's in the back seat, she says, Dad, is God in my shoe? I thought, oh, no. What am I going to say to a three-year-old about God? But notice a few things about this that I really think are important to observe. One, she asked me a question about God. That's extremely important. If you run across a child, even a preschooler, that doesn't ask you questions about God, doesn't say God's name, isn't inquiry about who God is, Something's wrong in their faith and their development. But here, the trained apologist needs to be able to answer the right thing about God. Because I can't and don't want to make her think that God is her shoe. That's wrong because God is separate from the world. And also I want her to know that God is everywhere. God is omniscient and omnipotent and everywhere present at the same time. So the correct answer, the short answer was, God is at your shoe, because God is everywhere. He's not the same as your shoe, but he is at everywhere, and so he's at your shoe. And I'll never uh, uh, forget this. When it came to Jesus, one of the things I did with my daughter that was extremely important, and I still use it today in her development and remind her of it frequently, is I got the idea of how important historical accounts about Jesus are. We know them as the four Gospels, and of course she needs to be learned and taught the four Gospels, but that's Christian education. What I did with her is I started first an oral list of every time she had seen a fire engine with me. 
Every time we saw a fire engine with its red lights on and its sirens going, was, it was a, a, a dramatic experience for both of us because we were usually very close to it and it was very loud. So I started an account that was oral with her that I used to give her periodically uh, at night, especially when she would go to bed. And I would just start off the first time I ever remember seeing a fire engine is when we were blah, 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 and I would explain it to her. And eventually I wrote that down for her. And write it in, in handwriting. I put it in the computer so I would preserve it. But write it down and have her read it. Why is this important? Because it's here that she's able to recognize her experience of the world being orally given and remembered and eventually written down. And this is exactly what the disciples experienced with Jesus and gives a reliable account of what they experienced. She knows the account I give of the fire engines is reliable, whether I give it orally to her or I give it written to her and she reads it. The account of the fire engines, because of her memory, is right, and that's exactly what we have with respect to the disciples. It may have gone through oral transmission, it was eventually written down, but their memory of their time with Jesus, because they were eyewitnesses and were disciples, is accurate and it's trustworthy, and that builds the confidence in her with respect to the Bible and what it portrays. Now when we move into the elementary grades, uh, one of the things with respect to the world that I think is really good and reinforcing, you start to get into perhaps some discipline issues. And I think it's here that it's very important to emphasize when they get into trouble that the world doesn't change and they can't change the world no matter how they think about it. Lies do not correspond to reality and the truth does correspond to reality. And when it deals with people and relationships and things, this needs to be reinforced to them, and they can't get around it. And the discipline and the correction aside, which is extremely important, I'm more emphasizing here the fact that reality is the way that it is, and they can't change it, no matter how much they would want to try to change it. What we know is not different than the way things are really in the world. Again, this goes back to the first one as well with the preschooler, but it's something that's going to be challenged later in college uh, when they go off. When it comes to God, it's here that I, I've already introduced with my daughter, probably third or fourth grade, they're going to watch the movie Star Wars. Maybe you'll hold it back even further, but eventually their friends are going to have it. This is a great opportunity to teach different views of God and for them to understand that not everyone has the same view of God. In fact, I developed a rubric. In fact, I got the idea from her fourth grade teacher. She came home with a rubric to listen to the presidential debates. A fourth grader had a rubric to fill out on the presidential debates. And I said, I'm going to start doing that for her movies. And so I did. I made up the rubric so that when she was done that with that rubric, she knew the difference between theism, which Christianity holds to, pantheism, which says God is the world, and atheism, which says there is no God. It's here that I want them to see that there are different views of God, and the Bible has the right one, the parent has the authoritative understanding of the right one, and the pastor has the right one, and some people are just wrong about their view of God. And she, they need to be aware of that. When it comes to recognizing Jesus, we need to recognize that people have different views of Jesus. My daughter came home asking what Muslims believe. They're going to do that. That's good. Again, she asked me what Muslims believe. She didn't ask anybody else. She asked me, the authoritative, or their pastor or their teacher. And guess what? I better have the answer. I better have the training to be able to give her. I try to keep it to three differences. They have a, a different view of Jesus with respect to dying on the cross. They don't believe that Jesus died on the cross. They don't believe that Jesus raised from the dead. And they have a different understanding of God. And be able to give her some details about those. If the parent isn't trained to do that, the pastor isn't trained to do that, then the child doesn't get a good answer to their question. And she also recognizes that friends, people at school, she goes to a public uh, school so she has people from different faiths in her classroom. Uh, if, they don't, if they go to a Christian school, then perhaps in the neighborhood they'll find people. But she recognizes that people do not believe the same thing. If my daughter comes home and says, you know, I think that all of the differences in faiths really ultimately are kind of the same, believing the same thing. That's problematic. That's extremely problematic. I've got to do something about that. Somewhere in her development, we lost something. Something went awry. Something's problematic, and I've got to intentionally go in and fix something. 
If I'm the trained apologist, um, I'll know how to do that and be knowledgeable about how to do that in that child and in her development. The fact that she comes to me and the fact that she models answers, or that I model answers to her and give her answers that are satisfying to her are extremely important in her development. It's here also, at this age, that the role of subjects in school become extremely important. And one of the things that they need to develop that will be important later to apologetics is the appreciation that different subjects study and yield different kinds of truths. Math will yield mathematical truths, that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Uh, and uh, history will deal with other things, like Abraham Lincoln was assassinated on such and such date. Uh, and uh, that deals, math is not going to give you historical truth, and history isn't going to give you mathematical truth. This becomes extremely important because keeping the subjects and the disciplines later on in Christian apologetics to establishing uh, what is proportional to the subject that it's able to establish becomes very, very important to their development and understanding. For example, I mentioned before that there's some things philosophy as a subject cannot do. One of the things is it cannot prove to you that you know the world. As my metaphysics professor, who's speaking here today, Dr. Richard Howe, said in metaphysics, he said, if a brick wall can't convince you that it's real, what makes any of us think that a philosophical argument about the brick wall is going to do any better? The world is just evident to us. The world convinces us that it's true. And that never should be lost or, sub or some subject think it can jump into there and demonstrate it or not demonstrate it. Because it's not the role of philosophy to demonstrate that. Now when we come to the middle school curriculum, the model shifts or the model changes. And here we're a little bit more intentional and can give some informal instruction where we reason to God for Christ. We still will reason with respect to the world, still will reason with, well, here we introduce reason with respect to the world, reason with respect to God, and reason with respect to Jesus Christ. It's here that we can be a little bit more formal about it and still be informally about it as well. The progression emerges that it's possible to reason and have evidence for things about or related to God and Jesus Christ. It's here that the child should ultimately recognize that their existence is something that is undeniable. Reality itself is undeniable. And when I was in eighth, when I was in eighth grade, I remember running into a kid that thought that everything was just a dream. There was nothing real. Everything was just a dream. Uh, that person may have had some psychological problems, but nonetheless, someone that would come along saying that needs help. Uh, it can't be the fact that everything's just a dream because you wouldn't know that unless you had the real to compare with the dream to know that it was a dream. So they need to understand with respect to reality itself and observe that some things entail their own truth or their own falsehood. They also need to see that we can begin to reason with respect to creation to a creator and start even looking at perhaps some evidence with respect to creation and how it points to a creator. Uh, creation entails a creator, such as Romans 1.18. The instruction should be in short and small doses. Uh, it must be activity-based, group-based if possible. Uh, again, if something is missed in their development, then we need to go back and find it and correct it with respect to what is missing. Uh, here, miracles and prophecy need to be emphasized that may come through Christian education or biblical education, but it's here it needs to be shown as a unique sign of God. It needs to be distinguished from magic, and the big word today is paranormal with respect to TV shows and hauntings and other things that go on. That's not what the Bible is portraying with respect to miracles. Miracles need to be distinguished from those other things as a unique sign from God, because it's here that we make the connection to God, and apologetics make the connection to God, giving us a sign with respect to prophecy of Jesus Christ and Jesus raising from the dead. Recognizes that there's truth and falsehood about God. And it's also here that we can remind ourselves and go back to the account of the fire engines that I gave to my daughter, of our experience with that. It's 
hear that sometimes it's introduced where they'll sit in a circle or be in a circle and some person will whisper in someone's ear a statement and it goes around and it's whispered to all the other students and then at the end it comes out completely different. Uh, and then that's used as an analogy as to why oral tradition or oral, oral things that are said are so susceptible to corruption. But not necessarily so. As the example I gave with the fire engines, I orally gave it over and over and over to my daughter. I said the same thing. I eventually wrote it down, and it's reliable so that there can be things that are transmitted that are, in fact, reliable. And, of course, here they need to make judgments with respect to accounts of the past, with respect to history, as being reliable or unreliable, because this, of course, relates to future apologetic education as well. And it's here that I'd like to suggest that one of the biggest problems that they will face as they go on to college is this notion of separating their faith from history and science and these other subjects that yield the results and the knowledge of apologetics that I'll use. That separation should not take place in their development. And here we need to keep it together. We need to show that math, science, history all point to the truth of Christianity and contains evidence that points to that truth. When we get to the high school level, and I'll be brief here, um, uh, it's full-blown systematic apologetic courses that need to be offered, whether it's at home through homeschooling, whether it's in the church and Sunday school, or whether it's in their Christian school if possible. It needs to be developed, and here we lay the foundation of truth, knowledge, self-evident truths, deal with the issue of God, miracles, evil, worldview, and then, of course, ultimately the Bible and Jesus Christ. Let me define this for you. This is a subject that is a uh, systematic presentation that is formally taught in an instructional environment that's Bible-based, it's Christ-centered, and it's age-appropriate. It's activity-oriented, and it's a program for all students to learn how to system systematically defend, communicate, use, and assess ideas and arguments to defend and advance the Christian worldview or the Christian faith. It's here that we are really behind the times. There is not much material at this level to even recommend you. There's some that I'm going to show you some resources here and go quickly through. But let me uh, mention this one that I put together. This is for the, t the parent or the teacher. Uh, this, is not for, this is not a textbook for the student to read, but this is to help the parent, the teacher, or the pastor put together the objectives that need to be taught in a formal course of study in apologetics. In fact, I give the objectives to you in this book and discuss their importance and their implementation into a course uh, on Christian apologetics. I deal here with the nature of the subject and also the practical applications and the practical implementing of the subject for the secondary school level. Two resources that I would recommend that are good at the secondary school level for a text in apologetics, both uh, written by my mentor, Dr. Norman Geiser, and my friend, uh, Dr. Turk, wrote one of them. One of them is advanced at the 11th or 12th grade level. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. The other one is more of a 9th or 10th grade reading level, When Skeptics Ask. These would be good books to correspond to those particular grade levels. Uh, both of these books do a good job of presenting worldview issues, arguments for the existence of God, and defending the gospel, the uh, historicity of Jesus' resurrection. When you get down to the middle school, junior high school level, there's a few things. Uh, one that does give you both the existence of God and the historicity of Christianity is Living Loud, again by my mentor Norman Geisler. But there's some other good books on the resurrection, I would suggest. They're not pictured here, but they're listed here. And I'll give you my email at the end, and you can email me. I'll send you all these slides so you can have all the information. You don't have to uh, jot it down or anything like that. Um, I'll send it to you. Lee Strobel has put some good things together. Some of these are good student editions, some workbooks, some things that would work good as lessons and classes and things like that. And then even going down to uh, some preschool resources. I, in fact, have this book and, and all the ones that are listed here. And I did them with my daughter. And let me caution you with some of these. Your kids aren't going to ask 200 questions about God in the Bible. They're not going to do that. They don't have the time to do that, much less the interest in doing that. So I really wouldn't suggest that these be used as if you read them from cover to cover. That's one of the mistakes I made. I started reading it cover to cover with my daughter, thinking this would be really good. We got tired of it after a while. 
Uh, instead, this is really a resource for the parent to perhaps use periodically when you're doing devotions and things like that from the Bible to come up with a question, and it gives you a suggested answer. You certainly can expand upon it and discuss it. It gives you the good questions. Most of the time, it gives you some very good thoughts. And as I said, most of the time, also, uh, I'm a teacher, and I uh, I correct some things in books and things like that. So I don't completely agree with it everywhere. But nonetheless, it at least gives you the questions, some Bible verses, and can give you some material to help you out and dealing periodically with questions. Don't overload your kids at this level with questions. They don't need 200 questions about God, uh, the Bible, or even the world and stuff. But every now and then, they might come up with their own question. If you don't know the answer, this is a good resource to say, I wonder if it's in there, and look at it, and give you kind of a heads up as to questions they may ask at their at their level. Uh, and I've, I have found uh, all of these resources to be helpful in preparing uh, some of those questions. But don't think that your kid has to ask that many questions. They they don't have to do that at all. Let me go ahead and conclude uh, with this. I emphasize that the most important person to get training in Christian apologetics are the people that are in this room here today and in this church. It's your pastor that needs the training, it's the parents that need the training, and your child's Sunday school teacher or school teacher needs the training in Christian apologetics. Uh, I am uh, uh, very convinced that our school, Southern Evangelical Seminary, does it correctly in terms of training the parent, child, and pastor. Uh, I think we are very, very good at it. There are lots of good schools out there, but when it comes to Christian apologetics, I think we are very good at it. Our website is ses.edu. We have online training. You don't have to show up to campus to take our classes. You can take them online. You don't have to take them for credit. You can audit them. Take a basic intro to apologetics class, and I can guarantee you, when you get trained in apologetics, you'll turn to the preschooler, the middle schooler, or the high schooler, whoever you ever see, and you will see in their development areas where apologetics is going to play a crucial role and that that area needs to be preserved in order to later create someone who can be trained and prepared in Christian apologetics so we will not lose them to the campus professor who's going to undermine their faith or to abandoning the faith uh, completely. Please feel free to email me. I know we've kind of gone a little late, but I'd be glad to answer any questions that you have at this point. Here's my email. Feel free to contact me. I'll be glad to send you the slides and help you out with any other curriculum resources that you might have questions about. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me here uh, and speaking, and um, it's really a joy to be with you uh, today as well.